So everybody, welcome. I hope everybody's staying safe and uh, not getting too bored out of your heads <laughs> around the house. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, vasculitis. So I've been kind of concentrating in the first few of these lectures on inflammatory uh, skin diseases. As a dermatologist, I really like those a lot more than a lot of the bizarre neoplasms and stuff like that. But uh, maybe next I think next week I've got vasculitis uh, and alopecia, and then the following week maybe we'll hit a couple of neoplastic things, uh, just to kind of balance things out a little bit. Maybe we'll talk about uh, uh, some important uh, cutaneous lymphomas. Uh, again, you don't need to know about all the bizarre lymphomas that the hematopathologists know about, but uh, maybe just some of the, the high points of those. And uh, maybe we'll talk about uh, some, some sort of dangerous uh, non-melanoma skin cancers, and then we'll, we'll kind of keep going from there. Uh, but today we're going to talk about vasculitis. And so uh, when you think about the histologic classification of vasculitis and the clinical uh, classification, really, it's kind of all over the map. I mean, people talk about uh, vessel size, whether it's large versus small, venulitis versus arteritis, uh, the type of predominant inflammatory response, whether it's a lymphocytic vasculitis, granulomatous vasculitis. Uh, they talk about pathophysiology, uh, leukocytoclastic, septic, thrombotic. So uh, there's no real one sort of, uh, I guess, systematized method uh, of, of dealing with this. So we kind of use all of the above as dermatopathologists. Uh, internists generally tend to use vessel size more than anything else. Uh, one thing just to realize, it, it's often overdiagnosed because uh, people that don't really have good criteria when there's any inflammation around blood vessels, they just say it's vasculitis. Like, for example, capillaritis. It's not really vasculitis. It's, it's a perivascular uh, inflammation of lymphocytes and you get leaky blood vessels, but it's not really and truly like a vasculitis that's targeting the endothelial cells in the blood vessels. Um, urticarial vasculitis also way overdiagnosed, especially by clinicians, by uh, internists, allergists. You know, for every real urticarial vasculitis you see, we see thousands and thousands of just routine urticarias. Um, and also, the blood vessel can be the, the primary target of injury. Uh, so there's true vascular inflammation or secondary. Uh, involvement. So if you get somebody that's uh, got a very dense inflammatory infiltrate like pyrimidine the blood vessels are going to get involved because they just happen to be in the way. But that's not really a true vasculitis itself. And then finally, lots of diseases cause vasculitis. It's a reaction pattern. And so sometimes we get internists that say, well, okay, it's vasculitis. What's the cause? Well, we sorry, we can't tell you. Uh, we can say it's one of many different things that can cause it. So you have to work the patient up, see if they have lupus, see if they maybe have an infection, you know, et cetera. So it's a reaction pattern. So the histologic definition for a fully developed small vessel lesion of vasculitis, like this little picture sh uh, shows, you need to have fibrin deposition within the blood vessel wall or thrombosis within the lumen or both. So that's really kind of how we histologically diagnose small vessel vasculitis in fully developed stage. A larger blood vessel, you know, it's not normal to get inflammation traveling in and out of the walls of a larger blood vessel. So if there's inflammation in the wall of a large blood vessel, even, even if there's no fibrin, um, that means that it's inflamed. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, due to immune complex or whatever, so it could be primary or secondary, but it means that there's really inflammation of blood vessel. We'll, we'll show you some examples of those. So the most common that we see, most common that you biopsy that you're worried about when somebody comes in with palpable purpura, obviously, is leukocytoclastic vasculitis. And this can involve either the small, the medium size, or the larger blood vessels. And when you talk to the internist, like my good friend Warren Piet, um, he says the skin really doesn't have large blood vessels. <laughs> He's probably right. So when we talk about a fairly large blood vessel in the skin that's situated down in the subcutaneous fat, um, that's not the same thing as a large blood vessel like a temporal artery, for example, or maybe like, uh, uh, you know, the aorta. You know, those are large blood vessels. So in the skin, we really don't quite get there. But we get larger blood vessels involved, and, and you can involve those or the, the capillaries or the venules. And once again, it's a reaction pattern. It may involve the skin alone or it may have internal organ involvement. So we'll talk about that too. And this is generally caused by immune complex Media, uh, mediation. So there's there's deposition of immune complexes there. So early on, 
You'll see little petechial lesions if it's urticarial vasculitis, which does happen. We do see it on occasion. You can get urticarial lesions, and later we get the classic palpable purpura. But there are lots of other manifestations of vasculitis, depending upon when you biopsy it or when you see the patients. You can get blisters, bully, uh, vesicles, pustules, ulcers, hyperpigmented patches if you get it really late. Um, so if you look at it really, really early, you'll just see a really sparse infiltrate of neutrophils uh, in and around the blood vessels with or without some nuclear dust and some extravasate erythrocytes and maybe some eosinophils. But super early, you don't see the fibrin. So if you do direct immunofluorescence or you do a PTAH stain, which I'll show you in a second, you can sometimes pick it up there. Not always, but you can sometimes pick it up there. Uh, later on, fully developed, obviously, fibrin, thrombosis, neutrophils, leukocyticlasia. So this is an early lesion. This guy really and truly did have urticarial vasculitis. So these were urticarial lesions. They didn't go away. They were, pretty, they were there for uh, more than 24 hours. He did have the bruising here. So he actually had it. And here's another patient. These are little early urticarial papules here with maybe some little early petechial change right in the center. It's really subtle, but these are what you see when you get early lesions. And if you biopsy those, or if you biopsy a little petechial lesion, you'll see this. You'll see it's a perivascular and with a little bit of interstitial infiltrate. Even at low power, you can see these are not all or lymphocytes here. As you go to higher magnification, you can see that there are neutrophils and there's lots of leukocytoclasia. So we don't see... Uh, any fibrin, we don't see any uh, thrombosis of blood vessels, we just see lots of leukocytoclasia, uh, and you may see some eosinophils here. So that's a very early lesion. And if we see that, we'll make the diagnosis. We'll call it early evolving lesion of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So we don't hedge it, we don't call it, you know, possible, you know, uh, PPD with neutrophils or anything like that. If we see that in the proper clinical context, we can make that diagnosis. And if you do a stain for PTAH, which is phospho, tungstic uh, acid hematoxylin, you don't need to know that, but just PTAH, um, actually can highlight the fibrin. So even though there's, this is an early lesion, there's some subclinical subhistologic fibrin that you can't see with H&E that you can pick up with a stain. We don't really do that very frequently, uh, but it has been reported in the literature and, and it's a way that you can kind of improve uh, the diagnosis. So this is a later classic lesion. This is what you see uh, in, on grand, on your wards, and you're, you're doing a consult, and the internist consults your real vasculitis, or somebody comes to the clinic, and you've got these little tiny petechiae here that later on involve these palpable purpuric lesions, and later on, they can even become uh, somewhat dusky if the epidermis becomes necrotic overlying it. So if something gets kind of grayish, gunmetal gray, that means the epidermis is dying. So over here, you get classic palpable purpura on the dependent areas of the body. Another example here, and this is the classic form if you biopsy a lesion in a fully developed stage. So here you've got the inflammation targeting the blood vessels. Uh, there's uh, fibrin in the wall of these blood vessels, and also there's some thrombosis of the lumen. There are neutrophils. There's leukocytoclasia. Uh, often there's some eosinophils admixed here. You see one over here. Here's the blood vessel. That's all fibrin. It's thrombosed. This is classic. This is if you're gonna get a slide on the board, you're not gonna see one like I showed you in the early lesion, you're gonna see this form. So this is a beautiful, classic example. And they would probably anticipate you to be able to make that diagnosis pretty quickly. They might give you a list of five diseases that can be associated with this or something like that. Here's another example. Notice the fibrin in the blood vessel, the neutrophils, some leukocytoclasia out here as well. So that's leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So here's a late lesion. So he's been around for a long time. Uh, most of the, there's no palpable purple left anymore. The, that's all gone away. So now we just have a lot of extravasate erythrocytes. Got some crusting here where the epidermis probably broke down overlying one of these two lesions. So this is a, a burned out lesion. And uh, obviously the, the specificity of the histology of this is, is less than when you get a classic early, uh, you know, fully developed stage lesion. So you probably want to stay away from one of these. But if you biopsy this and you see it, you can still see in many cases, some of the residual uh, neutrophilic dust here and uh, maybe a little residual fibrin in some of these blood vessels. But this is kind of a later stage lesion that's pretty much burned out. Okay, now sometimes, you know, I, I sort of bash the diagnosis of urticarial vasculitis because it's not super common and, and it's kind of a joke whenever we get a biopsy in here to rule out urticarial vasculitis. It, it never seems to be. But there are some cases uh, where you actually can get a patient that really and truly has urticarial vasculitis and you biopsy it and it doesn't always show 
features of fully developed LCD. So if you if you have a patient that it really truly are the highs lasting for more than 24 hours, not that the whole episode is, is going on for weeks, for example, which patients will tell you, and maybe they've been rubbing the lesions and they get a little secondary sort of bruising because they've been rubbing them or whatever. Um, then uh, you sometimes do get cases where there's a biopsy that doesn't really show it classically. So in those cases, you wanna work the patient up, make sure they don't have hypocomplementemia or elevated sed rate and they don't have an underlying case of something like lupus. But this guy really truly had it. So again, this, this is the what you see in urticarial vasculitis. If you, if you do you know, get a real bona fide lesion, these lesions didn't go away, and I had the bruising here. And then on the biopsy, this is what it showed in that patient. So it didn't really show the classic fully developed fibrin, whatever. We couldn't call this urticarial vasculitis, but we said, well, you know, there's some neutrophils here, there's some nuclear dust, there's some EOs, there's no fibrin. So we were suspicious of it. We said, you know, maybe it is urticarial vasculitis, but we just can't call it. So we see that on occasion too. And if, if you have a patient that really and truly think has it and has really got the, the true clinical features of it, um, then consider working them up even if the biopsy isn't specific for it. Now, IgA-mediated vasculitis, again, Hanak Shenline purpura, this can be seen in, in adults or in kids. Um, the Finkelstein's disease, the, the uh, hemorrhagic edema of childhood is, is part of this spectrum, uh, this condition. And uh, so there's two different peaks of this. You can get in, the, in adults, but also in kiddos. They can be associated with obviously fever, arthralgias, abdominal pain. Um, if you look at the biopsy, it looks pretty much similar to the other vasculitis I just showed you before. But there's one thing about this that's a little bit different. Uh, this tends to give more neutrophils more intact neutrophils, more evidence of pustular vasculitis than the other forms of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So if you're on, uh, you know, you're rounding with your uh, attending on the wards and you see a patient that's got pustular vasculitis and you want to kind of earn a beer, win a beer with a bet, say, well, you know, I'm going to bet that this is more likely due to IgA mediated vasculitis than to other forms of vasculitis. And there's a reason for that. IgA is a direct neutrophil chemotactin. So you tend to get more intact neutrophils, more pustular vasculitis when it's caused by IgA. And the differential of this can sometimes, because of that, include some of the other um, forms of neutrophilic dermatosis. So here's an example. Guy had HSP, looked pretty much like any other vasculitis, clinically really couldn't tell. Uh, this is, in this case though, with a kiddo that's got vasculitis like this, um, is almost always due to IgA mediated vasculitis. And they get these, uh, these dense, um, firm urticarial uh, edematous plaques often on their face uh, with kiddos. It's why it's called hemorrhagic edema of infancy. So it's hemorrhagic and it looks like an edematous process and you biopsy it and it shows vasculitis. And uh, the buttocks, common site of involvement. It's, it's the dependent area, obviously, in, in people sitting around or lying on their back. So here's the biopsy of it. It looks pretty much just like any other form of LCD, but it tends to have more dense infiltrate of neutrophils. So just remember that. Uh, neutrophils predominate more in IgA vasculitis. You get the fibrin in the blood vessel walls, the thrombosis of the lumen when you get a classic fully developed lesion. And then this is uh, when you, if you do a biopsy of this, usually within the first 24 to 48 hours, and you do direct immunofluorescence, you can see IgA deposited in the blood vessels here. Now, if you get it before 24 hours, it may be artifactually negative. If you get it like after 48 hours, it may be artifactually negative also because they break down. So immunofluorescence is great if it's positive, but if it's negative, it doesn't rule out vasculitis. And especially if you're dealing with non-IgA mediated vasculitis, I find it to be most helpful for this form. Uh, if you get somebody that's got uh, vasculitis associated with lupus or with a drug eruption and you do immunofluorescence on that, it's very commonly negative. You may see some fibrin, you may see negative, uh, re uh, negative deposition of other immunoreactions. It should be positive, but for some reason, it's just not always positive. So immunofluorescence doesn't generally rescue you in the diagnosis. And usually by the time you can see it with the uh, immunofluorescence, it's usually so obvious clinically and histologically, you don't really need it. So it's, it's helpful when it's positive, when it's negative, it sort of you know, just ignore it. Now, septic vasculitis, a different ball game here. This is due to infarcts, due to bacterial emboli, or, or not other things other than bacteria can cause it too. We'll, we'll show an example of that in a minute. And here you get, and the, and the key to this, is you get more thrombosis with intact neutrophils 
but relatively little leukocyteoclasia, okay, because this is not an immune complex mediated process. So there's no IgM and IgG and C3, et cetera, here. Here you're getting organisms with inflammation and then vascular thrombosis. So intact inflammatory cells here as opposed to um, breakdown products of them. Uh, organisms, often difficult to visualize, especially in some of the chronic forms. Um, if you get an immunocompromised patient, you can sometimes see them there. Uh, the, now this is something they, I don't think they're going to ask as much about this anymore. A lot of this is, is kind of more historic. And, and when I was a, a medical student, we used to really talk about Janeway lesions and Osler's nodes and whatnot. You should at least know what they are. Um, I don't think they're going to ask too much about this anymore because it's, it's, it's not really 100% specific. So classically, Janeway lesions are these red to pink macules or on, on acral areas. They're painless and they're thought to be caused by a little small micro uh, septic embolus, uh, which you usually can't see organisms in there. But if you do the biopsy, it kind of looks like a little septic vasculitis focus. Osler's nodes are thought to be more of an immunologic reaction to the bacterial infection, and these tend to be more painful. They're also on acral sites. Uh, they say they're on the tip of the fingers, the toes, but you know, what's the difference between the tip of the toe and the thenar, hypothenar eminence? It's a pretty subtle difference. So again, Janeway lesions here, possibly Osler's nodes. These are both on the tips of the fingers and the edges of the fingers. So these are a little bit more inflammatory, maybe a little bit more edematous. So anyway, I think the key though, is if you get like uh, petechial lesions on acral sites, you should think of possibly septic vasculitis due to somebody that might have uh, endocarditis or something like that and work them up. Now these are more characteristic types of lesions. These are more petechial. Uh, these, if you buy to these, you're gonna see evidence of vascular thrombosis here. These are early infarcts. Here, where you got the skin is beginning to kind of break down. It's got that, that grayish uh, discoloration on the surface of it here. Uh, these are fully developed infarcts here. So these aren't Janeway or Osler's nodes. These are, these are acral lesions of septic vasculitis where the skin has actually become, has gotten, in, it's infarcted here. So this is a bad situation. And usually when you get this kind of, uh, this degree of necrosis, you're dealing with something like staph endocarditis, something pretty uh, aggressive. So if you look inside the microscope, again, you'll see thrombosis of these blood vessels, usually the smaller blood vessels. If the larger blood vessels get involved, that's really a bad situation. Uh, you don't get as much fibrin here. You can get some, but not as much. And again, there's less leukocytoclasia, usually less eosinophils here. And then you get the overlying infarction here. So here's an example of one. Notice it's an acral skin. And notice there's not as much inflammation here as there was with the leukocytoclastic vasculitis. And the inflammation is just right around the blood vessels. It tends to target the blood vessels here. And notice that these are intact neutrophils. And you got some refractory red, red cells here. And this blood vessel here has got a little thrombus in it. So intact neutrophils plus thrombosis, most of the inflammation target around the blood vessels, septic vasculitis. So it's, it's a, an algorithm, two plus two equals four. Thrombosis, intact neutrophils, think sepsis. Here you get the thrombosis here and then the intact inflammation surrounding it. Now, again, if it's uh, an immunocompromised patient, um, sometimes you actually can see a lot of the organisms there. Pseudomonas, um, that you really see a lot. If somebody gets pseudomonas sepsis, it's a bad sign. You know, that, that's horrible. Uh, usually it's fatal, you know, get on that right away. That's the thymogangrenosum situation, not the, the cutaneous thyma that comes from outside in. This is inside out. Uh, gonococcus and meningococcus, again, surprisingly, you don't see very many organisms there. You think in, in like acute meningococcemia, you might, but you really don't. Um, staph, uh, generally by the time it does get into your skin, you actually often can see staph strep. Very, very difficult to see. And sometimes you'll see what looks like a, a septic vasculitis with a sparse amount of inflammation. Those are patients that are often uh, really young people that might have mitral valve prolapse and have a subtle manifestation of, of SBE. Uh, and the first manifestation may be just a few acral petechiae. And I've, I've made that diagnosis before. And you go back and do an echo and you can see a vegetation. So uh, it can be a subtle manifestation where, where biopsy can help you. Uh, somebody with a candidemia, a fungal, uh, they're usually severely immunocompromised and they usually don't have any problems seeing it. Uh, this patient had pseudomonas. So all this sort of group, these little particulate structures here, these are positive organisms here. This was a situation where it was positive with the Gram stain. So at thymogangrenosum, again, we just briefly mentioned this, there's two forms. Uh, the localized form that comes from outside in is usually caused by staph, usually uh, MRSA. 
uh, but it can be caused by a primary pseudomonas infection, less common. And then, of course, the pseudomonas sepsis is the other form with the necrotizing skin lesions, and that's, that's a bad situation. Um, so these generally tend to be painful, indurated lesions that become necrotic. They can get an eschar overlying, and these people are usually immunocompromised, often with a, a neutropenia, uh, tend to involve the uh, acral sites, but involve any part of the body. So you want to make this diagnosis pretty quickly if you can. Lots of thrombosis to the blood vessels, necrosis, uh, degeneration of collagen bundles, uh, variable amounts of inflammation because these patients may be immunocompromised. So here's a guy. And notice again, this sort of gunmetal gray, that's a sign that things are dead and dying here. And it's kind of spreading out here. They, they're kind of marking the uh, extension of this thing clinically. And here you see the epidermis is, is dead. There's minimal inflammation. There's lots of thrombosis of these blood vessels here. This is a sweat gland that's dead. And then there's edema and the epidermis is getting ready to just slough off because it has died here. It actually has sloughed off. And here you can see this is all Gram, uh, this this is pseudomonas in this situation. It's 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 uh, got this basophilia of the collagen, but this was actually due to pseudomonas, which is gram negative organism. But it looks blue because the collagen is blue. It's not that the organisms are are blue here. So here are the blood vessel totally thrombosed, minimal inflammation, and all of this contained uh, breakdown products of, uh, of the organisms with degenerated collagen and then overlying epidermal necrosis. Now, gonococcemia, most commonly women of childbearing age, especially near the menstrual period. Uh, and this is a classic situation where you get pustules over the joints, once again, with this sort of uh, infarctive uh, uh, characteristic. And they commonly get an asymmetric polyarthritis involving the knees, the wrists. So uh, those joints, usually not the, the smaller uh, joints, to get, so you get relatively larger joints. Uh, you can get a relatively dense neutrophil rich infiltrate. So just like the IgA mediated vasculitis, uh, the organisms of uh, gonococcus and meningococcus, uh, again, these are gram positive cocci and they also tend to uh, cause neutrophils to uh, flow to them directly. So direct neutrophilic uh, chemotactic uh, capabilities. Here you get thrombosis of numerous blood vessels, again, with the overlying epidermal necrosis and more intact neutrophils with less leukocytoclasia here, just like the other things we talked about in, uh, in septic vasculitis. And you don't really see organisms very commonly here. So these are some examples. You get these little small pustules, again, with the infarcts overlying them, often over joints. So think of that when you think of gonococcemia. Here's the arthritis, the knees, the wrists, the puffiness here of the, the joints. Do an x-ray, they're fuzzy like this. This is post-treatment and everything's better. And uh, here's a biopsy of one. Notice again, it's on acral skin. And we're going to higher magnification, neutrophils. Again, not that much leukocytoclasia, but lots of thrombosis. And inflammation tends to be closer to the blood vessels here. So this is gonococcemia. Pretty classic example of that. Okay, and then here's the epidermal necrosis overlying it with that sort of infarctive uh, color to it. Meningococcus, there's two forms of this, the so-called acute fulminant form, a bad situation, often fatal. And then the more chronic form, and uh, this is the type where you end up uh, people, uh, the, the kids go to the, uh, to the camps in the summertime and maybe they're carrying this and then they get an, an, a, an epidemic inside the camp and lots of people get it and they get the, the chronic carriers can then spread it and then some people come out with the acute form. Uh, and just like uh, gonococcemia, you get lots of vascular thrombosis with pretty much intact neutrophils. So these are, these are kiddo with uh, acute meningococcemia, notice this sort of infarctive area here, the stellate ulcer that's developed because of the underlying thrombosis of the blood vessels. And here's an example of the pathology, which pretty much like gonococcemia. Once again, intact polys, thrombosis of blood vessels, relatively limited leukocytoclasia. There's the vascular thrombosis over here. Okay, so hopefully you'll remember that. A candle sepsis, again, this is uh, where you're getting fungemia, uh, same sort of thing, but instead of getting uh, uh, bacteria, here you get fungi causing the blood vessel uh, thrombosis. Uh, and this is usually a very bad sign. It's usually somebody that's uh, immunocompromised, usually a leukemic patient, something like that that's neutropenic. And uh, here's a, a child that had leukemia that was on chemotherapy. Unfortunately, this uh, kid didn't make it. And I uh, got the, all, look at all these blood vessels here. They're just, even these larger blood vessels down to the subcutaneous fat this time, are thrombosed and uh, there are neutrophils. Notice all these neutrophils are intact. There's no leukocytoclasia here. The intact neutrophils inside the vascular thrombosis 
And then the gram, uh, the PAS stain highlighting all of these candle organisms inside this blood vessel that's just plugged. And so uh, that is a very, very bad sign if you get that uh, situation here. A lot of these organisms were also not only in the blood vessels, they were also actually in the, in the skin. And here you actually see that they're budding and forming the pseudohyphae um, in, the, in the dermis as well. Now let's shift gears and get away from the infectious conditions and look at some other variants of vasculitis, erythema elevatum diutinum, an interesting condition. This is a chronic form of vasculitis. It starts off as a leukocytoclastic vasculitis with palpable purpura and, and macules and papules, but later progresses to plaques uh, in the periarticular areas most commonly that ultimately end up with these fibrotic nodules, especially around the joints. And this is a reaction pattern that's often associated with an underlying infectious condition. So they can be associated with bacterial infection, they can be associated with HIV disease, they've been associated with Ig and paraproteinemia. So if you get somebody that has this disease, you need to then make sure that there's not some underlying process there. So if you get an early lesion, it just looks like classic evolving LCD, but later on it gets a nodular form of vasculitis with neutrophils, eosinophils, onion skin, perivascular thrombosis. There's a grin zone uh, between the inflammation and the epidermis. And then later on, you get the fibrotic changes. Now, this looks histologically virtually identical to granuloma faciale. So this is a histologic identical twin. But clinically, it looks quite a bit different. So here you get these, these uh, plaques, some are crusting. Again, if you just saw this clinically, you might think of uh, dermatomyositis, for example, if you, if you just saw that on a clinical basis. Here's another example. Now they're becoming more nodular. And then here's some nodules present on the volar surface of this person's thumb. Elevator EED. Here's a plaque on the elbow. And then if you biopsy this, it shows this nodular and diffuse infiltrate, as you can see at low magnification, volar skin. And as we go to higher magnification, you can see it's got this very dense infiltrate. It's got neutrophils. Um, it has leukocytoclasia. It's got thrombosis of the blood vessel. Okay, so this is the dense nodular infiltrate, nodular type of pattern with vasculitis. Um, and erythema elevatum diutinum. And if you had a biopsy of EED of a, a granular facial of somebody's face, it looks identical. If we had a later lesion, I don't have a later lesion to show you here, I guess I should probably include that in the future, but it shows more of an onion skin fibrosis with the same kind of inflammation within that onion skin fibrosis that we see in an even later lesion of EED. Now, moving away from uh, vascular injury where there's lots of inflammation, to vascular injury where there's limited inflammation, and this is still kind of under the umbrella of vasculitis, if you will, or vasculopathy, um, cholesterol emboli. And here clinically, you'll see a patchy lividoreticularis-like process, because what's happening here is you're getting, in, you're getting uh, thrombosis and alteration of the underlying blood vessels that feed the upper uh, skin. Sometimes this is down in the, in the larger blood vessels in the, in the subcutaneous fat, but you get this abnormal, uh, blood flow as a consequence of this, and it leads to this lividoreticularis-like appearance that can ultimately actually uh, ulcerate in some cases. Uh, there's often a history of atherosclerosis. Patient may have had previous surgery, uh, and then you can get ulceration if it's, if it's extensive. Usually there's limited inflammation here, and if you, if you're, you need to actually see, if you wanna make this diagnosis with, uh, with certainty, you get the elongated cleft within a small to medium-sized blood vessel in the skin, uh, and that's how you can make the diagnosis. So here you see that lividoid pattern, uh, that, uh, that sort of purpura here, that's classic due to this altered blood vessel, secondary to the thrombosis of the blood vessel. And here we see, unfortunately, this was decapitated up here, but we'll look down at the blood vessels in the dermis, and there's almost no inflammation, but you've got this cholesterol cleft sitting inside this blood vessel with thrombosis of the vascular lumen here with fibrin in it. So cholesterol, that plugs the blood vessel, causes this fibrin deposit, and then you've got the uh, example of a cholesterol embolus. And notice that there's almost no inflammation here. Now, one other thing that we're also seeing today that we uh, didn't see uh, too many years ago is that these people get these uh, Dacron uh, vascular grafts, sometimes that stuff can break off and embolize and then uh, plug the skin like you see here and give you the same type of injury and it looks similar, and you can actually identify the Dacron material, or it's not always Dacron, but it's this exogenous mesh that they're using 
for these uh, artificial blood vessels that they're putting in. So we're seeing more and more of those cases today, um, and it gives you a, a similar clinical appearance. Um, and this is the overlying epidermal sets of the chronic. So in this case, this actually was dying because of the underlying ischemia that was induced. Dagos disease, malignant atrophic papulosis. Um, clinically, these are pink to red papules, often on the trunk that are painful. They ulcerate and then they heal with this white porcelain appearance to them. And uh, this is associated with GI involvement commonly. Uh, they can get uh, abdominal involvement, cramps, vomiting. They can get GI infarcts, perforate, uh, lead to peritonitis, and ultimately uh, can die from that. So this is a disease you want to make sure that you don't miss. Um, it's often associated with uh, underlying connective tissue disease, and a lot of people now think it's, it's just one manifestation of lupus. Uh, and I would bet if we work this up more thoroughly, we're probably going to find one of these funny uh, new antibodies that's associated specifically with this variant of lupus. It may be lupus slash dermatomyositis. But if you look at it on the microscope, generally relatively sparse infiltrates, sometimes some neutrophils, sometimes some lymphocytes, and then you see mucin around the blood vessels Blood vessel walls, often in the deeper part of the epidermis, you'll often see thinning of the epidermis centrally, uh, which is related somewhat to that uh, infarct that they get, but also it looks a lot like lupus. And that kind of makes, makes sense if we think this may actually be a connective tissue disease. So here's an example of one. They often get some telangiectasia. There's that porcelain white uh, color to this lesion. These are the papules, and there you see the little central infarct. And uh, you look at this area right here, it looks like an interface dermatitis a little bit with thinning in the epidermis, but there's also this kind of wedge-shaped uh, pattern where it's, uh, the collagen is degenerated here uh, due to ischemia. And uh, so if you just had a high magnification of this, it, it looks a lot like what you see at the chronic lesion of discoid LE with some smudging at the dermatodermal junction and thinning in the epidermis with telangiectasis. And that's kind of why some people think that it, at least uh, histologically, sometimes can look like lupus and, and may be related to lupus. This is the inflammation around the blood vessels. And you can see it's got this kind of edematous, mucinous deposition around the blood vessels. That's pretty characteristic for Dagos disease. And then uh, if you look carefully, here's an area where there's uh, some thrombosis of this blood vessel in this situation with this uh, degenerated blood vessel wall over here. So that induces the overlying ischemia. They get the infarction. You get the same type of pattern if you were to biopsy a blood vessel in the GI tract. And here's the mucin. So just remember, a lot of people think that... Uh, Dagos is, is related to lupus and maybe to dermatomyositis. Uh, Wegener's, uh, lots of different uh, uh, situations here. Uh, clinically, can look like a small vessel LCV like palpable purpura, but it can also give you ulcers, uh, indurated papules and nodules, subcutaneous nodules. You can obviously systemic involvement of the lung, the nasal cavity. Uh, you don't have to have that, but, but it's commonly seen. Uh, the three main histologic findings, again, just like the palpable purpura, if you biopsy one of those, you're going to see leukocytoplastic vasculitis. If you get into more of the deeper, uh, more nodular lesions, there you can see the so-called churk strauss granuloma with the palisaded granulomas dermatitis with central zone of leukocytoplastic vasculitis looking like GA. And that is similar to interstitial granulomas dermatitis associated with arthritis um, that we talked about before. Uh, and then you can get granulomatous vasculitis, where you get actual granulomatous inflammation with fibrin deposition in the blood vessel walls. Now, there's not too many things that give you granulomatous vasculitis. So if you see that, you have to think of this. A syphilis can do it, temporal arteritis, and then Churg's draft, which is probably related to this, but that's really about it. So there's not too many things that really give you true granulomatous vasculitis. So this patient had Wegener's. Um, all of this kind of livid reticularis like change is due to the deeper blood vessel involvement. There's an ulcer over here. These unusual nodules on the back of this uh, person's feet were all due to the underlying inflammatory infiltrate. Uh, this patient, this isn't the heart should normally be over here, but actually everything shifted over here because they had a pneumothorax, because they had this, uh, this cavitary lung lesion that resulted in that. And here's an example of, uh, of the vasculitis associated with Wegener's. So again, if we could show just a classic small vessel LCD, but this is more of the deeper nodular type of vasculitis involving the larger blood vessels. So dense nodular infiltrate. And notice that the infiltrate has got these pale cells in here. So there are histiocytes here. So this is the granulomatous vasculitis, histiocytic uh, infiltrate here, multinucleated giant cell. Here's a blood vessel that's got uh, fibrin in its wall over here. And another example blood vessel is thrombosed here 
with granulomatous inflammation and some lymphocytes and a few neutrophils surrounding it. So this is the granulomatous vasculitis associated with Wegener's granulomatosis. So again, granulomatous dermatitis, not very common, but if you see it, uh, it you think about Wegener's to make sure you don't miss the internal involvement. Now, lipidovasculitis, uh, again, there are two different forms of this, and, and some is well known. I mean, you're probably all familiar with atrophy blanche, but there's really, there's two main types, and the one that we see by far the most common is the one that's associated with stasis dermatitis, stasis-associated lipidovasculitis. And then there's a type that's associated with things like lupus, hypocomplementemia, uh, painful ulcers, usually on the ankles, often worse in the summer months, uh, there may be a little bit of reticularis like pattern in some of the early and subacute stages. Uh, if you get it early, you can sometimes see palpable purpura, but then later you get the atrophic uh, white quiver form scars and uh, the stasis change, very, very common. And in my opinion, and, I, and I've seen this very commonly, the reason that people get ulcers and stasis ulcers is that they have this process going on somewhere that we just don't see histologically. So my theory is if you biopsy somebody with stasis ulceration, they have stasis dermatitis, you're going to see stasis associated lipidovasculitis there somewhere if you cut enough sections. So uh, most of those respond beautifully to things like Plavix, uh, things that, that uh, decrease neutrophils, and, and Plavix is way better than aspirin and persantine. Uh, so again, I think if you have somebody who's got a stasis ulcer, you ought to think about putting them on Plavix. But anyway, if you look at the histologic changes, the thick-walled stasis ulcer blood vessels with lots of fibrin in the blood vessel walls, um, you can get uh, variable amounts of neutrophils, variable amounts of leukocytoclasia, not a lot, and then you see the other features of stasis change, ulceration, sclerosing, paniculitis. These are classic manifestations of, of atrophy blanche here, uh, the white burned out scar-like lesion here, and then these little other lesions now that are probably early new lesions developing in the setting of a long-standing uh, situation of atrophy blanche here. So if you biopsy one of these, you're going to see a more active lesion with fiber and maybe even some neutrophils. And here's an example of what we see. So ulceration, these tufts of thick stasis altered blood vessels in the dermis, and notice that there's fibrin in the blood vessel walls and thrombosis of the lumen with these prominent stasis altered blood vessels. This is a Plavix deficiency. Uh, if you put these people on Plavix, they just get so much better. The pain goes away usually within a few weeks. The ulcers heal. Um, they're going to be your most grateful patients. They love you. Uh, so think about using that as a drug for this condition, and it works beautifully for it. So here you see the very thick wall blood vessels with the fibrin. So again, uh, it's often reasonable to consider biopsying a, a stasis ulcer. Obviously, you want to make sure you're not uh, missing some other cause of the ulceration, but if you see that and you and document it, um, you can make a definitive diagnosis and, and treat the patient with a medication that will, will, will get rid of the fibrin. And the reason that platelet works, uh, that Plavix works well, is it inhibits the fibrinolytic uh, the fibrinolysis is not really active enough in this condition because of the ischemia. So they get excessive deposition of fibrin. It's not really an immune complex mediated process. It's basically an abnormality in their ability to get rid of the fibrin that gets deposited. And if you do immunofluorescence, you'll, you'll see positive uh, immunofluorescence for fibrin in these blood vessels, like you can see here. So uh, basically the idea is to, to get rid of that fibrin and, and Plavix helps that happen. Uh, thrombotic vasculopathy. Uh, here, basically, once again, you're dealing with this lividoid purplish gray discoloration with variable amounts of sloughing, depending on how much ischemia that you get. Uh, these people are usually pretty ill. Uh, they may have, an, they almost all have some type of an underlying process. So they may have DIC, they may have circulating periproteins like uh, lupus anticoagulant or something like that. Uh, they may have had some kind of medication uh, that's associated with it. And when you look at the biopsy here, they get usually almost no inflammation with lots of thrombosis. And then you get necrosis, a necrosis of eccrine sweat units, which is the first manifestation, uh, necrosis of uh, follicles, uh, sweat gland, uh, 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 sebaceous glands, and then they get ulceration. So these people are usually pretty sick. Uh, this guy here in the ICU, uh, this is what these lesions look like, these necrotic, uh, purpuric areas, blisters were forming here in this individual. Uh, and then here's a biopsy. And notice there's no inflammation, virtually no inflammation, but you get all this thrombosis of these numerous small blood vessels. Uh, this guy, I believe, had circulating uh, lupus anticoagulant or some kind of protein here. 
and you can see it's got this uh, thrombose blood vessel here with almost no inflammation. So um, this is not a good situation when you see this. These people are obviously you know, ill and you need to work them up and find out what's causing this, the, uh, the abnormality that we have here. Now, this condition we've also been seeing recently. The good news is it seems like it's decreased in, uh, um, in its incidence. Uh, I'd say back five, six years ago, we we're seeing quite a bit of this. Um, so it seems to have gone away, so, uh, so maybe these drug guys have moved on to different, uh, different drugs and are not using this adulterated cocaine. I think uh, uh, people were hearing about this and maybe they kind of uh, were switching over to other drugs or whatever, but uh, we're not seeing as much of this as we were a few years ago, thank goodness. Uh, but basically what happens here is they're using levamisole to uh, adulterate the cocaine. Uh, levamisole, it used to be used for uh, kiddos with pediatric nephrotic syndrome, and they found that it caused a vasculopathy uh, and agranulocytosis, so it's not used very much anymore, but it is used still on occasion for, uh, for treating helminthic infections, and it causes a uh, m massive amount of thrombosis with uh, burgers like digital necrosis, uh, necrosis of areas around the ears quite commonly, and it gives you this P-anchor-positive uh, vasculitis uh, with antiphospholipids, and uh, sometimes you get this ANA positive antihistone antibody as well. These are the kind of lesions that you see in these people. They start to get these necrotic uh, ulcerated areas on their ears quite commonly, the lividoreticularis, lividoid areas with necrosis on the, on the trunk and the buttocks. Um, and when you biopsy this, it looks more kind of like a thrombotic vasculopathy with, it does generally have more inflammation than like the last case I showed you. Sometimes you'll get relatively, uh, a prominent neutrophilic infiltrate here, but lots and lots of thrombosis. So if you see this uh, in a patient, think about the diagnosis. Here's a later lesion that ulcerated and was biopsied at a later stage of evolution. And, and sometimes you get a neutrophilic influx. This is probably secondary um, to the ischemia rather than a primary process, but they do get this ANCA positivity and ANCA can be associated with, with neutrophilic dermatoses. So it's possible that may be related to it. So here you see once again all this thrombosis. This patient actually did have a fairly abundant neutrophil infiltrate as well. Occasionally, and this doesn't happen in derm very much, we'll be uh, involved with a patient that's got one of these uh, deeper seated vascular lesions like temporal arteritis or arteriosclerosis or obliterans. Uh, so we don't really see this in derm very much, but we may get consults because the patient's got an ulcer or something like that and they wanna see if, if we can tell them what the cause of the vasculitis is. And this condition is usually associated with things like muscle pain, uh, fatigue with exercise, digital gangrene, uh, and these are due to artery uh, involvement. And uh, usually larger blood vessels in the arteries are kind of affected secondarily, usually seen in smokers. Uh, and so here you're getting the larger blood vessel that's totally thrombosed here, and they get these overlying secondary ulcers. Uh, so this is, uh, is Berger's disease. We don't really see this in Durham very frequently, but if you see it, it's pretty uh, aggressive condition. These uh, gangrene and, and involvement of these distal areas here. Here you see an arteriogram and notice that there's no blood flow in those areas here. It's totally devoid of that. So basically just you're getting thrombosis of these arteries way back in this area and then everything just chokes off distal to that and then end up getting the, the gangrene. So here's an example of one of those looks like uh, under the microscope. You don't really see this in, in Durham very much. Uh, the the uh, sort of last couple of things let's talk about, lymphocytic vasculitis. Now, this is rare, okay? For every real lymphocytic vasculitis, we see lots of perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. So uh, be careful of this. It's not diagnosed, it's not really real most of the time. A lot of people overcall this. So in order to really get it, you really need to see uh, the fibrin in the blood vessels and the inflammation in the blood vessels as well, but with lymphocytes. And we see it in a few cases. We do see it in pleva sometimes. We do see it in lymphomatoid papulosis rarely. We do see it in pernio. We see it in bachettes, but the, the list is small. So this is not very commonly seen. I'd say probably the most common situation where we see it is, is in pleva. And it's usually the real pleva, not pterosis like it's chronica. It's usually the kids that have the pretty aggressive form or there's a superficial deep infiltrate. Uh, they can get some of the epidermal necrosis and the crusting the interface change, and then you'll see real, true, honest to goodness, lymphocytic, uh, lymphocytic vasculitis beneath there. So here's an example of the real pleva, and here you get the interface change with the crust and everything, but he actually and truly did have some real, honest to goodness, lymphocytic vasculitis here. 
So again, there's no neutrophils here. These are lymphocytes and his blood vessel is thrombosed and there is fibrin. So they, so they got it this time, but it is not very common. So just realize that for every one of these, you see lots and lots of just perivascular lymphocytic inflammation that is not really and truly uh, caused by uh, a lymphocytic vasculitis. Now, moving down to the larger blood vessels, polyarteritis nodosa. Uh, again, this is a panarteritis. You get medium sized to small blood, blood vessels involved. Um, you can also get um, a small vessel LCD. And interestingly enough, this sort of what the opposite of what you would think. The bigger the blood vessels involved in PAN, the less likely to get the widespread systemic involvement. That doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it is. Usually when you get PAN that's got the small vessels, the, the microscopic polyangiitis, as a lot of people are using that term today, then they get kidney disease. So when they get the small vessels, they get the systemic involvement. When they get the larger blood vessels, it tends to be involved in the skin only. And these are some manifestations. You get the little reticularis like change where you think a larger blood vessels involved, ulcers. Uh, so again, other manifestations. And here's the more classic larger blood vessel involvement. And notice it's a paniculitis involving just the area of the fat. It's sort of almost like a rifle shot. It picks out this blood vessel, involves it alone, doesn't tend to involve the septa of the, the, uh, the lobules of the fat very frequently. So it's kind of a septal vasculitis with paniculitis. And it just picks out this blood vessel, involves it, and gets inflammation surrounding it with lots of fibrin in the blood vessel wall and thrombosis of the lumen here. So this is a true inflammatory targeted vasculitis. This isn't secondary involvement, this is real involvement here. So there we, you see that in polyarteritis polyarter nodosa, beautiful example of that. And here's a, uh, a, a elastic tissue stain, you can see that showing the elastic uh, uh, in the wall of the blood vessel, so it's an artery uh, as opposed to a vein here. And superficial thrombophlebitis histologically looks very similar to this, tends to pick out the blood vessel, which happens to be a vein. And here, rather than getting the liver reticularis like change and the ulcers and whatnot, it tends to be more like a cord. Uh, and it causes the inflammation migrating along the course of the vein. It tends to be migratory, uh, associated with chronic venous insufficiency, hypercoagulable states, perineoplastic, the Trousseau sign associated with cancers. Um, think of this, it, that can give you superficial thrombophlebitis. So here you see some examples of that or linear involvement, cords. Sometimes these are, are diagnosed mostly by palpation. And here you see something that looks kind of similar. So it's just kind of picking out the larger blood vessels in the fat, but this time it was a vein. So this was migratory thrombophlebitis in this case. Okay. Now, just the last couple of things, we'll talk about some vasculitis associated with paniculitis and nodular vasculitis. We'll, we'll hit this again when we talk about paniculitis also. Uh, generally synonymous with erythema indoratum. There's sort of two forms histologically. This, I don't spend a lot of time memorizing this because it's kind of historical, but erythema indoratum, the so-called Whitfield type, was thought to be non-tuberculous associated with hepatitis C, and then the erythema indoratum, the Zan type, uh, thought to be a tuberculid associated with the mycobacterial infections, but histologically, these kind of look the same, and uh, I don't think they're really, we're not really emphasizing a lot of that today, and I don't think I would really waste a lot of time on that. But here, the involvement is, tends to be on the posterior calf. Um, so I suppose there's an adosis with some of the anterior part of the lower leg. This is the posterior part of the, of the leg. It tends to ulcerate, drains an oily material, which is the generated fat. Again, medium-sized, larger blood vessels, and subcutaneous fat with lobular paniculitis. So as opposed to PAN and migratory thrombophlebitis just hits the blood vessel, leave the lobules alone, here the lobules are involved. So you, they get degenerated and they, these ulcerate and they drain this, this oily fat on the surface. And you get a lot of granulomous inflammation here. It's easy to miss the vasculitis with a punch. So you need an incisional biopsy. Here's a classic example. The posterior part of the lower legs, the calves involved, they ulcerate like you see here. And here, notice that there's an extensive involvement of the lobules with the vasculitis. So, so this is a larger blood vessel vasculitis, granulomatous inflammation, and lobular inflammation with degeneration of the fat. Thrombosis of the blood vessel, fibrin in the blood vessel, fibrin in the wall of the blood vessel, granulomatous inflammation, lots of lobular involvement with this granulomatous inflammation. Histiocytes, beautiful example. 
nodular vasculitis, erythema indoratum, and it's not always associated with infectious diseases, by the way. We see the same, uh, you can't see with Hansen's disease, other TB, TB infections, but sometimes with, with uh, uh, connective tissue diseases. So it's a reaction pattern, again, just like regular vasculitis is a reaction pattern. This can be a reaction pattern seen with a lot of different conditions as well. It's not only hepatitis or tuberculosis. Uh, looks very similar. It can be seen in, even in connective tissue diseases. Calciphylaxis, again, associated with renal failure, but some patients get this non-renal failure subacute form that can actually survive and do reasonably well with this. Most of these, though, you got to be very worried about them. Uh, they often uh, have uh, hyperparathyroidism and uh, can be fatal. So if you make this diagnosis, uh, make sure you work them up, make sure they don't have uh, the abnormal uh, calcium phosphorus uh, product that needs to be treated with uh, parathyroidectomy. Uh, they often get the eschar formation, the uh, ischemic necrosis, and they get secondary sepsis from that. And here you get a, uh, can give you a lobular paniculitis, the vascular thrombosis. Sometimes you see a very subtle amount of calcification with little tiny blood vessels are involved. So here, these are some examples. Again, all these infarcts and eschars overlying it due to the underlying vascular thrombosis. All this calcification down here in the subcutaneous fat, it hits mostly the lobules. And then overlying that in the dermis, you can sometimes see thrombosis without calcification. You get a little bit of that in the fat here. So these blood vessels, you also get a protein S and protein C deficiency here. And you can get the thrombosis as well as the calcification of the blood vessels uh, in this. So they get the overlying ischemia with uh, the secondary uh, infarctions. So uh, in summary, uh, make sure you, you know your criteria for this, know the, the way that we diagnose these, know the different blood vessels that can be involved. They can have a lot of inflammation, have almost no inflammation, the granulomatous inflammation, um, can be associated with abnormal circulating proteins, be a sign of more serious involvement. So again, know your criteria and don't overdiagnose uh, lymphocytic vasculitis. So again, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, just as an announcement, uh, so again, we'll have this next uh, Monday and Friday again as well. I think Monday we're going to be talking about paniculitis. You'll see some a couple few of these same things uh, in that lecture also. And uh, just one other thing for those of you who live in our general area, starting next Tuesday, we're actually going to be implementing a rollout of a drive-through COVID-19 testing for the virus, and then hopefully shortly thereafter, we're starting to test for antibodies. So if anybody's interested in getting tested, uh, we're gonna be making an announcement and putting it uh, out on the internet. Uh, we have a website that uh, the name of it is uh, dfwmedicaltesting.com that you can go to and learn more about that. But uh, we're gonna be rolling that out and we're gonna be offering a discounted fee. It, there, is, there is a charge for it because it's, it costs us money to do the test. Uh, but uh, we're going to be giving a significantly discounted fee to any first responder, which would include any uh, person in the medical profession, such as anybody on this uh, uh, webcam here, because uh, we're going to, you're obviously first responders. So anyway, thank you guys.